guests, file, fellow members. I usually don't dress up, but just for a guest tonight, I will. But with that said, how many here have traveled overseas? Raise your hand. Bermuda. Yeah, that's close. Bermuda. Bermuda Triangle. Careful of that. Um, with that, how was your flight? How was the flight attendant? How was the service? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable? What airline was that? United. United? Okay. <laughs> Ouch. Spirit Airline. <laughs> that's going to hurt. That's going to hurt. But, but oh, like, anything else? Any other airlines? Qantas? Cafe Pacific? Air Jamaica. Air Jamaica. Ooh, I went to Tonza. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you love Tonza? Yeah, yeah. So the, the theme is, or my task is to tell you, have you ever wanted to be a fighter attendant? I remember probably in the 80s when Pan Am was still around, and I was able to, you know, observe the flight attendants. As a what five or six year old, you're the guys, and I didn't tell anyone that was my dream. That was my dream to be a flight attendant, not a steward, because back then there were only female flight attendants. But with that said, let me explain to you and give you little uh, highlights. I'll give you the ABCs, the one, two, threes, or the steps. What do I mean by that? The interview process, the training and what we call the onboarding. The reason why, this is a seminar, whereas if you go to a trade school, you will actually have to pay them to train you to become a flight attendant so you can get a job. But here, my seminar is for free. So with that said, let me get started. Remember I said I had a dream when I was five or six? She was like, guys, oh my gosh. A couple years back, there was a TV show they, they stopped it, it was Pan Am. That show, if you all recall, they all dressed up, real nice suits, ties, and everything. Same scenario. I'm not talking about the d domestic, okay? I I'm talking about going overseas, flying, real food. Right? None of these crackers, none of these, you know, peanuts. With that, and here's my trip. I finished school early. I went to Gonzaga University. I finished early, finished school uh, one year ahead. So I went back home in the summer. And again, I'm from Guam, so I go back home. And lo and behold, there was an ad in the newspaper. Nowadays, it's probably more internet, right? There was an ad. You want to travel the world? You want to be a flight attendant? Hmm, that's interesting. I was like, yeah, remember that dream I had when I was five or six? I'll try it. but. I'll give it a, a whirl. If not, you know, I'm going to go back and, and start my graduate. Okay, so the interview process, it was tough. There was three interviews. It was like a, I would say, like assembly line. 100 plus folks, three interviews, they did a physical. What the physical was, carrying luggage. You know, they trying to lift it up and close it and everything like that. So it was three interviews. The first interview was, you know, how do you deal with people, explain, you know, the kind of job interviews, situational. Okay, I got through that. Maybe I winged it a bit, but, you know, I gave them whatever, you know, my good judgment education. They told me how to wing it. But with that, then the second interview. Okay, uh, explain to me why you really want to do that. I want to travel the world. You know, I'm, I'm great in customer service. I did my research. You know, just tell them whatever they want to hear. Then, they come together as like a committee, a group. The two people I interviewed and the manager of the flight attendant group. We probably won't put it this way. My seminar today is a PG-13, and I'll just leave it at that. The five minute Q&A, that's rated R. We can talk about that later. So going back to that question, they meet together, I sit down just like this, and the first thing they said was, what's your sexual orientation? Like, what? My jaw dropped. But back then, I was like, you mean, do I have a girlfriend? Yeah. And I'll explain later on. So I was like, okay, and I went through a couple more questions. Now, keep in mind, that will come back to haunt me later on in my career. 
when can you start? I was like, holy crap. I went through the three interview process. I Even before I went through the interview process, I was hurry up driving up to the interview process, as I mentioned. There were 100 plus folks. Prior to that, I actually got in an accident. Some lady was backing up, flying a slot, she hit me. And then I was trying to exchange the information. I was like, I, I'll give you that later. I have the interview good. Lo and behold, she was the person in the interview process too. It's like, oh, okay, well, that's fine. Good to know. That's a plus for me. There are 100 plus applicants. 25 got accepted. I was one of them. And when they said, when can you start? Whatever. Not really. I was like, oh, crap, I got to go back to grad school. <laughs> there goes my you know, $50 deposit. But that, it was well worth it. That was my dream. So that's the A, right? The interview process. It's like herding cows. 100 folks, 25 got in seven. But they were trying to, as I look back, you teamwork. You work together, different personalities, and see if you fit. Then come the training. It's in three phases. It's a 12 week process. First four week is evacuation and all that stuff. Then the next four weeks is aircraft, turn oven, cook, and all that. Then the last four weeks was customer service. Now, remember I mentioned about customer service? Somebody said about United. Well, I hate to say it. I didn't work for United, but I kind of did. So I worked for Continental Micronesia, which was merged to United. So, you know, as I explained, 12 week interview process, well, excuse me, the 12 week training process. The first four weeks was training. And what does the training encompass first? Life vest. Put it on, you yank it. Me being smart, I yank it before I jumped out of the airplane. That's a no no. <laughs> That's the first thing they teach you as a passenger, right? <laughs> Imagine that. So they gave this for me as a souvenir. <laughs> so I would never, ever forget. So that's part of it. The other part, remember I mentioned this is a PG-13? So some of the parts, I'm not sure if you notice is the takeoff and landing is the worst. In other words, that's where the accidents happen. Taking off and landing. So when the flight attendants sit down, you're in your harness, your hands are palms open, and you really just don't look and stare, you're actually thinking through where's the evacuation, where's my equipment and everything. So we have to go through those training. And one part of the training is, you know, excuse the language, I say in advance, this is PG-13. Bend over, heads down. I'm like, hmm, what is bend over, heads down? In case of emergency, right? Not when you're seeing the doctor office, right? Bend over, heads down. <laughs> Completely different, different type of scenario. As a good Catholic, I always mention I have a Bible. During the safety training the first four weeks, this is my Bible. We have it with us all the time. I don't remember anything, but in case emergency happens, what do you do? Flip it open. And I'll share that with you. This is called my in-flight manual. So we go through that, it has all the equipment, and the training really helped. Fast forward, I helped deliver a baby from Guam, Honolulu, midway. Well, you can't seriously turn around when you're mid-flight, you know, you're halfway point between, you know, Wake Island and Honolulu, you gotta continue going. So, training helped, and it really did. The important thing about training, it's recurrent training. Just like anything, they pound it through you, year after year, and you gotta be, in other words, certain industries, you gotta be recertified. That's the same scenario there. The other one is, and in that manual, the second or the mid is the next four weeks. It's on the aircraft. This is my ride when I go to work. It's a 747 200. It's not a 300, it's not a 400, it's a 200. The reason you can tell is the newer version has winglets that go up. This is a gas load. It just sucks up and it just kills the you know environment. But that's it. Other than that, it's great. 
We learned the aircraft. There's various aircrafts that you fly. Other times, what we fly is a, you'll like it, a DC-9, DC-10, and 737. Those are what we call island hoppers. One time, you go on a training, and you come down real fast, and you land real fast. Because in a short island, there's no long runways. You gotta hit it real fast. So those are the types of airplanes you gotta remember. But you don't remember it, you have your manual. Because at certain flights, certain segments, you do different flights. With that said, the last, or the third four weeks is customer service. And what's customer service? Someone mentioned about uh, doing chicken or beef. And I use the term, yeah, I did chicken and beef. I did first class chicken and beef. I did business class chicken or beef. And I did economy chicken or beef. And I met my wife on first class and I gave her nice chicken or beef. <laughs> It worked, she's my wife. But with that said, there are a couple of things that you have to learn. As a flight attendant, you do more than that. You have to be a trash manager. You gotta do trash. What if you don't have the right count of food? That's worse. The passengers don't get meals. And they really, really get mad, especially some business and first class customers. What's your name? As usual, you always have a name tag. They will write you up. They're known to do that. Remember I mentioned only 25 folks went through the training? They give you a hotel, and it's great. It's like being on vacation. Not really, but you get a roommate for 12 weeks. I still remember his name, Orly. I wanted to beat him up after the second day. But, you know, that's what it means. You work together. The 25 folks that we went through, we went again, swimming. We did bend over, heads down part, remember that? But that's more evacuation and customer service. I knew everything you think about liquor. More than college to teach me. Mimosa, mixed drinks, how you hold a nice fine and pour drinks and everything. I'm more of a chicken beef economy type of guy. So after that, you're not done. It's what you call the OJT, the onboarding. My first onboarding was three onboardings, and I still remember that today. It was a Japan flight, a Hong Kong flight, and a Bali flight. With that, no, we didn't stay in a hotel, it was a turnaround. But being on a flight attendant, you're on a snoring system, so you start at the bottom. So they found it would be really cool I was the tallest one, I was like a new recruit, right? Now, I want you to go to the cabin and check their air sack. So how do you do that? Grab the bag, walk around, collect the air sack. That's what I literally did. And everybody behind me, all the flight attendants were back in the galley, just slapping. And I get it, you know, I got picked on, so I can handle it. But then, okay, my next flight, remember I mentioned Three OJTs. So you stand there and you do the safety demo. And remember the airbag and the face mask when you top it down. Again, this is PG-13. Remember in the restroom you have some white covers? Well, they use that. And when I did it, that's what came out. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. I, I can deal with that. But then comes the third part, being a flight attendant. Your first couple years is hard. You're on reserve. So I finally get my badge. I'm a little younger, my hair's a little black, but you know, I'll pass it on. But I had <laughs> great, it was great. But I had some TLC. What do I mean by that? Timing, I had luck, and circumstances. Usually when you start off, you're on call 24 seven. They call you odd or hours, get to the airport, or you stay in the airport, and in case someone's sick, you, you jump on. That's what's called being on reserve. Until you build up seniority and you get your own schedule or your line. I didn't like that. So I thought, well, how can I move up without killing anybody? 
legally. So there was an opening that for a flight service manager. And I applied and I got accepted. The great thing about that is I was in charge of this nice 747. I was the go-to person. Everything happened around me. So I did everything. I was the go-to person to the pilot, the ground agents, everything. In between that, that's where I met my wife, and then I'm gonna stop there, and remember I mentioned this is a PG-13? Like I explained to my wife, everything before I met you, you can't ask me about, because that was before I met you. That was the rated R portion. Enough said. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to open it up to Q&A. Yes, sir. This advertisement on flight attendance in the world, do you actually get to do any touristy stuff or do you have to be in the plane and then go around? Do you actually get to see sites and... Yeah, we do. So, uh, it, it depends. That's a very good question, Tom. My ride to work was on a 747. So I picked my schedule, and my schedule was Guam to Narita, Narita, Honolulu, Honolulu back. So each time, or each stopover, we get at least 24 hours to 36 hours of rest. So being young and stupid, I only got three or four hours of rest. <coughs> if I needed to sleep, I'd sleep on the plane after I did service. But yes, we had a lot of things to do. Uh, again, I mentioned it. For now, we'll stick with the PG-13 uh, version. Yes, there's lots of things to do in Japan. You, you go karaoke, right? So there's a hotel that we stay in called Zeniku. That's uh, in Japanese, ANA hotel. All the crews go there, and we fight for the money. We fly with other you know, airlines, British airlines. They're the worst. They're real uptight. But, and yes. We go to Disneyland. I, I mentioned in the past, I got uh, actually chased one time by uh, some folks in New Guinea, which I didn't know that they were cannibals back there. And I was hitting on one of the guy's sister. So I kept running. But yes, I, I had fun. I could write a book about it, but I changed some names. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. What is your worst? customer that you ever have to deal with while working in Continental? Um, good question. There are a lot, but the one that sticks out is uh, flying into Seoul. Um, Seoul, it, it's a cultural thing. Uh, if the service is not good, they would protest. So we were delayed. It was because of a mechanical reason, and it, we were in the ground three hours. So in, during the ground, we fed them, fed them hot dog thought that was beneath them. Okay, we calm them down, you know, and each flight I had a language speaker. And that language speaker I said, hey, we're sorry, you know, here's some food, you know, it won't happen again. They didn't like that. So when we landed to Seoul, what they did was they protested until the media came on board. That wasn't enough. They wanted a rebate. That wasn't enough. I heard after the fact, they went to the station manager's office, beat the crap out of them, just for good measure. That's just a culture thing. But in between that, did I mention culture? So all of the older folks on the plane, because you know, I'm pretty, I was skinnier. I walked through and I was doing the cart. The older folks, when they want something, they don't raise your hand. They pitch you in the rear to get your attention. That was a no. But apparently that was a cultural thing and you're allowed to do it. So that's the worst. Thank you. Sir? What year did you do this before? I'm glad you said So it was uh, 95 through, and uh, I'm an open book, uh, 2001. When so, I was 2001, that was where I was heading. Yes, so <laughs> this was right before 9-11. Wow. So what happened was it was, me and my wife, well, yeah, at that time, yeah. Uh, we were supposed to go to uh, Honolulu for a honeymoon, and all flights were stopped. And all my friends, they got this 
No, Guam, everybody's in the service. They got called up. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not going here. Huh? <laughs> Uncle Sam's calling. I got to go kill some people. No, really. So that's what happened. We got shut down. And then that's when, uh, I hate to say it nicely, uh, they used the term furlough. You got a nice pink slip. And that was because I remember at that time, Boeing stocks went down to $25. So everybody went down, so I, I had to change profession. Not by choice. I didn't do anything wrong, but you know, it happens. Any other questions, concerns? Yes, ma'am. Uh, did you ever met any celebrity in the business class? Oh, yes. Do you remember Alex Trebek? Yes. 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 Yep. So he was on flight. I, I took a picture with him. And another one. Do you remember JFK? Yes. Okay. And his uh, girlfriend, slash Carolyn. So they went to Palau for diving, and we got a picture of them and everything. Real nice couple, and then you know what happened thereafter. But yeah, they're they're real nice. Of course, they were business class or first class. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.